Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on the IPCC Working Group One report. We are so pleased you can join us today to learn about the latest science on climate change and its implications for the planet. As you're probably aware, this report, uh, it's called the SIX Assessment Report. It gathers together all our latest understanding of climate science and tries to present it in a, a coherent whole that uh, people can understand and our policymakers can act on. Uh, the report was launched this last Monday by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and it's been making news ever since. So this is a great opportunity for all of you, most of you who are journalists to um, learn more details about the report and to explore subjects like the significance of the report and why, why it's important for you to cover it. We're gonna learn about the key highlights and findings in the report and what is different about this year's, this year's report uh, and including a, a special focus on regional data. People are always interested in what's, what's in store for them in their own countries and regions. And we hope to learn more from the report about uh, such regions. What are the implications for, uh, for our planet? And what should journalists know about the report's contents that will be relevant for your audiences across the world? Uh, this webinar is jointly hosted by my organization, Internews' Earth Journalism Network. We are a global community of 14,000 journalists from around the world, and we're very pleased to be joined by the UN Foundation in sponsoring this webinar. They've been great in, in helping us bring our wonderful panel of speakers together, who I can introduce now. Uh, we have three uh, eminent scientists who are able to join us. We have Carolina Vera, who is the vice chair of IPCC Working Group One and a professor at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. We have Yuba Sokona, uh, a vice chair of the IPCC, who is based in Bamako, Mali. And we have Swapna Panikal, the lead author of Working Group One, uh, Chapter Four, and a scientist at the Indian Institute for Tropical meteorology. Um, and we're very pleased. Thank you, all of you, for joining us today. Um, the way this will work is each speaker will present for roughly 10 minutes. Um, it will present in a row. And that will take up roughly half of the webinar. And then we will open it up to questions from all of you. If you have questions, please type in your questions in the Q&A feature that you can see a button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, that is where you should enter your questions. Uh, we realize there's also a chat that is used for separate conversation uh, about the webinar itself, but not, if you have questions for the speakers, please put them in the Q&A feature. I will moderate them, curate them, and then pose as best I can to the speakers once they have finished their presentations. I'm sorry if I can't get to all your questions. We're expecting a lot of questions, but I will do the best I can. And of course, uh, you know, the speakers will do their best to answer. So um, we're, I won't take up much, much more of your time. I'll just say a couple of, of other items. If you're interested in learning more about the Earth Journalism Network, maybe this is your first webinar with us, please check out our website at www.earthjournalism.net. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we're gonna ask you to please fill out a survey to tell us what you think of the webinar, whether you think it was helpful or there are ways we can improve it. We'll be sending you, everyone who has registered, uh, a survey to please fill out. So we we'll appreciate your help with that. But let's get the show on the road. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Carolina, who's gonna talk about some of the key findings of the report, kind of from a bird's eye view and touch on some of the new chapters, perhaps. Uh, Carolina, would you like to take it away, please? Thank you, James. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, sharing with you uh, the main highlights of our uh, recently approved uh, report. Um, it, I, would, I would like to start with some numbers. Uh, as uh, it, it, Sorry, the, the reports 
are not uh, the uh, authors that are involved in the IPCC reports and don't actually conduct the research itself, but instead they assess thousands and thousands of scientific publications from all around the world. In this particular occasion, the IPCC Bureau selected an author team with uh, 234 authors from 65 uh, countries. 28% of them were, uh, are women, and 63% uh, of them uh, have uh, taken new roles as a, a IPCC uh, authors. Uh, the review process involved three stages of um, review, and we got more than 78,000 uh, review comments. And in particular, 46 countries commented on the final uh, government distribution. Uh, I will share with you some of the key messages that uh, we have in this uh, report. Uh, for example, the one that we can see here, that recent changes in the climate and wines and are widespread, rapid, intensified, and unprecedented in thousands of years. Uh, this, uh, of course, uh, we know for decades that the uh, world is warming, but the, rich, uh, the uh, recent changes uh, we can see here in this figure that uh, shows the evolution of the global surface temperatures. Uh, we could see that uh, the human influence uh, we have confirmed has warmed the climate at the rate that is unprecedented in at least the last uh, 2,000 years. Uh, currently, the report uh, uh, concludes that we are at the 1.1 degrees of Celsius warmer than the uh, uh, pre industrial conditions. And in addition, the last four decades has also been a unprecedented uh, warm. But uh, uh, we have also uh, uh, identified and detected uh, changes in other parts of the climate uh, system. Uh, for example, the levels of the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are the highest in at least the last two million years. Regarding the, uh, the sea level rise, uh, over the past 100 years, sea level has risen at faster rates than it ever did in at, at least 3,000 years. And for example, let's take the Arctic sea ice uh, area. The summer uh, area is at, at, at its lower uh, level in at least 1,000 years. And the retreat of glaciers on a global scale since 1950, uh, 1950 is unprecedented in the last 2,000 years. But the warming has already uh, experienced uh, has um, far-reaching consequences. Uh, for example, uh, since the 50s, hot extremes, including heat waves over land and the ocean, have become more frequent and more intense. Heavy rainfall events have become more, in, more frequent and more intense. And we see increases in drought in some regions. Uh, uh, the concept, this consequence no, to heat, rainfall, and droughts touch our whole planet. Not just people, but also plants and animals, both nature and agriculture. The growing season of plants has lengthened it on average in large parts of the northern hemisphere. Fire weather, that is the combination of dry, hot, and windy conditions that is conducted to wildfires, is becoming more frequent in many parts of the world. And multiple changes are also taking place in the ocean, uh, which is warming, acidifying, and uh, losing oxygen, affecting ocean life and the people who depend on it. Uh, and unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to 1.5 uh, degrees will be beyond reach. Uh, in the report, we use five illustrative scenarios uh, that uh, to uh, describe the future uh, emission uh, scenarios. Um, uh, the report shows that in the next 20 years, global warming uh, uh, over, uh, is expected to reach or exceed 1.5 above uh, the late uh, 1800s for all scenarios. However, uh, if we rapidly, uh, rapidly reduce greenhouse gases emissions, if we can reach global net zero CO2 emissions around 250, it is extremely likely that we can keep global warming well below two degrees. However, if we do, uh, if global uh, greenhouse gas emissions remain 
around today's levels in the uh, coming decades, we could uh, reach to uh, degrees of global warming by the middle of this century. Uh, and uh, the, the report, in addition, uh, shows that with every additional amount of global warming, uh, changes get uh, larger. For example, in this case, I am showing you that every additional half degree of, of warming will cause increases in the intensity and frequency of hot extremes uh, and also in heavy precipitation and droughts. One of the uh, uh, main aspects that, uh, that the report has in, increased the knowledge is in the human influence attribution. Uh, and one of the key messages is it is uh, that uh, it is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall and droughts, more frequent and severe. Uh, human influence uh, has been, uh, been uh, uh, as identified as the main driver of hot extremes, which have become more frequent and more intense, the ocean warming since the uh, 70s and ocean acidification. Uh, human influence uh, uh, has also been identified as a main driver of changes in the frozen areas of the planet, particularly the global retreat of the glaciers since the 90s and 40% of the decrease in the Arctic sea ice uh, in the uh, 79, and also the uh, decrease in the, uh, in the spring snow cover since the 50s. Uh, another, uh, uh, I would say, highlight of the report is the fact that it shows that the climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways. And also that these changes we experience will increase with further warm. 30% uh, of the uh, information that uh, gathers this report is uh, dedicated to regions. This is unprecedented in the working group one uh, re uh, report. And so this new regional information that is displayed in many different ways, uh, it's uh, intended to inform decision related, <coughs> sorry, to risk management and adaptation. If, um, so in addition, we have introduced a new concept, climatic impact driver. Climatic impact drivers are essentially those climate conditions that can, uh, with uh, their changes, uh, can uh, promote uh, an impact in uh, uh, natural systems, in socioeconomic sectors. And so uh, we have uh, also uh, identified thresholds uh, that uh, if the, these climate uh, impact drivers go over them, uh, they, uh, they could lead to several consequences no? for people, for uh, agriculture. Um, we have uh, uh, categorized these climatic impact drivers. There are like more than 30, 30 almost 35 uh, different indicators that we can uh, categorize it in these types, heat and cold, rain and drought, snow and ice, wind, coastal and oceanic, uh, and open ocean and the other, uh, others too. And um, uh, uh, the, the report has a lot of detailed information that I, I, I'm, I don't have time now to explain all of them. But uh, as I, I said, uh, uh, we, we can confirm that all regions of, of the world has uh, at least some uh, uh, or even multiple climatic impact drivers uh, changing, and in some cases, a combination of them. Uh, I would like also to introduce, this is a, an excellent tool that we have developed in the context of the report, that is an interactive atlas. Uh, uh, through this um, a link that uh, I can share later in the chat, uh, you can access to all the uh, data and information that uh, underpin the report and uh, develop your own figures for your own region, for your own uh, uh, a climatic impact, uh, impact driver of interest, for example. Um, another key message is that uh, there is no going back from changes in the uh, climate uh, system. Uh, this uh, is a, a, a long lasting change no, for uh, many parts of the uh, climate system. Let's, uh, we are talking about, for example, the, the cryosphere, 
the ocean conditions. Uh, for example, I can give you some, and, and also the sea level as a consequence of that. I can give you some uh, uh, detail about that. For example, the report show that over the course of the, this century, global ocean temperature is projected to rise two to eight times as much as it has increased since early 70s. The melting, for example, of the Greenland and ice, Antarctic ice sheet will continue for thousands of years. This means that the sea level rise will keep rising. And coming back to today, the rate of the sea level rise keeps increasing and the rate of ice sheet loss has increased by a factor of four in the past 30 years. But the good news is that uh, some changes could be slowed and others could be stopped by limiting work. So finally, I would like to finish with uh, these uh, last key measures to limit uh, global warming, strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in CO2, methane, and greenhouse gases are necessary. We confirm that there is a linear relationship between the um, accumulated CO2 in the atmosphere and the increased temperature. And uh, also we have uh, a, a show uh, that half of the emissions of CO2 are taken up and stored by both uh, the land and the ocean. But we know that if we release even greater amount of CO2, these natural carbon sinks would wake up a smaller proportion of our future emissions. And finally, this report also shows that while CO2 is the dominant greenhouse gas and reaching net zero to CO2 is required to limit global warming, strong reduction in other greenhouse gas emissions are needed. Amongst them, uh, methane reductions together with strong air pollution controls would benefit both the climate and improve the air quality. So uh, just to uh, end, the, clim the climate we experience in the future depends on our decisions now. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Carolina. That's a great overview of the findings and working group one report. I'm going to turn it over now to Yuba Sakana to talk further about uh, the findings of the report. Yuba, would you like to take it away, please? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Good. And thank you for uh, inviting me to this conversation. I hope it will be a uh, uh, proactive and then uh, interactive with the audience. And I am with uh, Swapna and Carolina who are working group one, while I'm much more a working group uh, three person than uh, working group one. Uh, I just want to compliment uh, what has been clearly indicated by Carolina that uh, the report of IPCC, just a working group one report dealing with uh, climate science, is a, 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 the first of the series of two reports that will be coming next year. The second mm -hmm. one will be on impact adaptation and vulnerability. And then the third one will be on mitigation of climate change. And the report gives a much clearer picture of the past, the present, and future climate, and which is essential for understanding where we are headed and what can be done and how we can prepare. And this clearly is different from what has been so far uh, done by IPCC, which is the reinforcement bring some of the newer elements. And the story the report is telling can be captured under four related headlines. And then the first one is related to the evidence from the current science, uh, the current state of the climate. And then those are based on the analysis of the observation, and that is much more frequent and wider in different parts of the world, uh, even if some of the uh, regions such as Africa is relatively limited based also on the uh, modeling, a uh, six model that has been, um, uh, uh, the simulation that has been carried out by a number of uh, uh, scientists in different parts of the world, 
and it's related also to uh, the fact that uh, a number of studies that has been conducted, as Carolina indicated, there is a 14,000 publication that has been analyzed. And then to capture the uh, current state of climate, how it is changing, and then the role of human influence, the state of knowledge about possible climate uh, uh, features, and then the climate information relevant to the different region, the sector. And the first one, as I indicated, from the story that the report is telling in the current uh, state of climate, bringing new elements, new insights. And then the second uh, element of the story the report is telling is a possible future of climate. And then based on also the knowledge of the past and then the present. And that indicates also some uh, clarity on number of issues I will come to that uh, based on the African region. And then the third element, the story the report is telling is the climate information for risk assessment that is critical, essential for regional adaptation in different contexts. And then the last uh, element, the report, the story the report is telling is limiting future climate change. And then this also is what uh, Carolina indicated. And then that will be much more explored by the working group two and the working group three. And then uh, 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 before that, clearly indicated based on the findings, if the world want to keep the warming to 1.5 by the end of the century, it is, it, 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 it is reachable if we have a drastic mitigation and then we will take drastic mitigation and then to take number of actions that will be otherwise it will be reached and then to attain a zero uh, carbon emission by toward the uh, middle of the century. And then that will be much more explored by the working group for uh, uh, three. And if we take zooming a bit, what the report tell us, in the African region, we are not going to the detail. Uh, he said that part of the Africa have warmed uh, more than 1.5 degrees. And then if you said that the global temperature one to actually is around one degree. In certain part of Africa, we are above, we, are, uh, we have reached 1.5 degrees. And then having in mind also that uh, the uh, share of the global carbon emission in the continent is relatively uh, low is roughly less than 5%, but some figures indicate that it's around 3.8%. And then that the current increase of the temperature increase the exposure and the vulnerability of the continent. <coughs> That's related to uh, because of the number of existing challenges the continent is facing and then climate will become an add-on related to the uh, the fact that uh, the poverty issue, the fact that uh, the limited infrastructure, the urbanization in the process, the fact also that uh, the uh, main uh, livelihood of the people related to agriculture is climate sensitive, and then all those different aspects is, and then the faster is urbanization. And it increased, it indicated also the rising temperature in uh, that part of the African continent because we will uh, experience more and more heat waves in different parts. And I don't know if you look at the, uh, the news, it indicates clearly that in the Northern Africa, uh, in Algeria, in Tunisia, there is some fire that is happening there and uh, the difficulty they're facing related to the increase of the temperature over there. And then we'll see more frequent intense climate extremes, and then such as heat wave, heavy rains, and drought. And then the Sahel region are very well known as much more prone to dry and then to uh, severe desertification. What we are experiencing in the past uh, few months is heavy rains with a lot of death. Uh, Niger experienced 660. Uh, people dead with heavy rain. And then this is something that is happening in the report indicated also that in the Sahel, there will be 
much more heavy rain uh, in contrast with uh, Southern Africa and North Africa with uh, much more dry. And then we will have novel climate in the tropic and then sea level rise of 16 centimeter. And then that's Carolina indicated also that we cannot get back to that. There's some irreversibility, particularly on the case of sea level, sea level rise. The report indicated also the increase in rain and uh, the wind speed of cyclone that will become much more frequent. Cyclone was not uh, used, African was not used to see cyclone, but in 2015, we have seen in the Horn of Africa in less than two weeks, two cyclones ha happening. In addition, later on, we have seen Ida with uh, Kenneth in uh, Southern Africa, uh, Mozambique <coughs> that create a lot of uh, devastation in terms of uh, livelihood of uh, people and then of uh, ecosystem. And the in the African context, the report indicated the issue of uh, expansion of arid dry area. They are growing and shifting much more. And then from, <coughs> sorry, from where they are actually, and then to go to the upper area of the, the continent. And then with uh, the frequency and then the prolonged and intensity of the drought, and then caused and or exacerbated by uh, climate and uh, uh, human activity. And then the report indicated also they will be exacerbated by, uh, by, uh, by, by drought. Uh, and then the erosion of, uh, will be intensified and particularly in uh, coastal area as many uh, tourist area, many countries also have uh, their uh, main city, big cities around the coastal area, and then that will be uh, affected. And it's important to uh, have also, uh, there is uh, all the IPCC report, including this one, indicates some gaps. And then some of the gaps, and particularly if you look at the African region, in many developing countries, and in particular the African region, is related to the data and information issues. And then uh, we have more indication, we have more information on the uh, uh, regional issue, the regional aspect, but however, there is a need of strengthening the observational system, there is a, a need of strengthening the uh, data system and then the, uh, to conduct also some studies, specific studies on better understanding and the, the dynamic of the regional uh, climate issues and the climate perspective. And those are some of the elements I just wanted to highlight to complement what has been uh, indicated by Carolina and then to have uh, interaction with uh, the uh, audience on issues they will be uh, particularly interested to, to bring in. And then having in mind, this is on this climate science report, it is not on adaptation, it's not on mitigation, and then it's the better understanding of the dynamic of the climate change of the world and in different regions. And thank you. Thank you, Yuba very much for that overview of, of uh, further reports we can expect and also for what uh, the African continent can expect, expect. Just before I turn it over to our third speaker, just a reminder to please put your questions uh, in the Q&A feature. You'll see a button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and if you click on that, you can enter questions that you may have for the speakers. I, I, see, we, I see one of the questions is, what will be the next steps uh, to act on the report? And uh, so I'll, let me briefly go over the calendar, kind of as Yuba alluded to. In November of this year, we're going to have the UN's uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change will be convening its 26th Conference of Parties, where they will be discussing uh, policy steps. So that'll be a very important conference. and. If you're a journalist covering climate change, you will want to pay very close attention to that and plan to report on that in close detail. And then 
early next year, probably February and March, we'll have the release of working IPCC's Working Group 2 report and Working Group 3 report, which are on the uh, impacts of climate change and vulnerability to climate change, that's Working Group 2. And then Working Group 3 will present more on the uh, solutions to climate change and how, how to mitigate climate change. And, and then even later in the year, there will be a, a full-scale summary for policymakers that will be released. So lots of things going on over the next year related to climate change. But now, please let me turn it over to our third speaker, Swapna Panikal. Please take it away, Swapna. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and good morning, everybody. Myself, Sopna, from, I'm a lead author of chapter four and I'm from Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. And we have already seen that climate change is affecting every region on earth. So whatever changes we experience, they are projected to increase with further warming. In this presentation, so I will I'll, I'll focus more on some of the regional changes that are projected to occur over the East and South Asian region. So this is a map which is showing the spatial patterns of temperature change at different levels of warming. As the planet warms, the climate change does not unfold uniformly across the globe. We can see that some patterns of regional change that scale with increase in the global warming temperatures. And this is the panel which is showing the observed in temperature, like one, one degree ten increase in temperature we have been seeing for the observed recent periods. And with, with the one degree warming, we can see that these patterns are very much prominent, like the continents are warming more. We can see much more warming over the land than other regions. And if we go to the higher levels of warming, like 1.5 to 2 and 4 degree warming, these patterns are get much more prominent. We can see like Arctic is warming much higher than the other regions. And also like the land is warming much more than the ocean surface. Northern Hemisphere more than the Southern Hemisphere. And if you see for the Asian region also, at, at, at the end of the century, the higher warming is projected over the Asian region. So as the planet is continued to warm, these changes are going to increase. And also the observed changes in the probability and the magnitude of the extremes, especially the hot extremes, are projected to increase. For example, an incre increment of half a degree of warming because, because of the increase in the human influence on the climate system, the hot extremes are projected to warm. And this is just a simple map, this pattern showing like how the hot extremes are going to change, are changed globally over different regions of the globe. And we can see these are, this is the South Asian region. This is the Southeast Asia. This is East Asia. So all these regions, we can see that there is a higher increase in the hot extremes during since past since 1950s. However, over a specific regions, these regional increase will also depend upon the regional factors, like how much will be the warming expected over a particular region, what are the atmospheric circulation patterns, and what are the dynamics. But if you see for in Asia as a whole, we can see that at a two degree warming itself, we can see like hot extremes are projected to increase. And if we go to at higher levels, these extremes are even projected to increase with further warming. We can also see like precipitation patterns are also going to enhance with warming. And this is the pattern with like 1.5 to 2 and 3, 4 degrees centigrade. We are seeing like the, at, though, though, though the temperature pattern is much more prominently coming out, there are some uncertainties when we talk about the precipitation increase with warming, but still we see that these patterns are so prominent. We are seeing like higher precipitation in the higher latitudes, both in the Northern hemisphere and Southern hemisphere. Also, we can see like increase in the precipitation of the tropical regions, especially the monsoon precipitation or the Asian region, it is going to enhance with warming. And it is also projected that by the end of the 21st century, both the South Asian and East Asian monsoon will be higher, but it will have a lot of interannual variability. 
if you look at the precipitation extremes, because as Carolina and Yoba have already discussed, like when the temperature is increasing, we will we'll expect more extreme events, extremes in the hot extremes, extreme precipitation events. This is just an illustration, like how the extreme precipitation events are going to enhance with warming. These are scaled from one degree to four degree. So an, an event which is happening at a probable percentage of 7% increase is projected by 35% by at a four degree warming. That means that there's a two to three times in doubling or increasing in the hot ex extreme precipitation events with, with higher warming. This is because when the temperature, when the atmosphere warms, the moisture holding capacity of the atmosphere increases. As the moisture holding capacity increases, the extreme precipitation events, they are projected to increase roughly by 7% per degree of global warming. And the increase in the frequency of heavy precipitation events will, will be projected to increase. If you see for the Asian region, so this is just a pattern of change, what is projected over the Asian region as a whole. The first panel is for the temperature and the middle panel is for the precipitation and the heat extremes in the upper right panel. We can clearly see that whatever temperature increase, what we have seen over the Asian region, it has clearly come up, emerged out of the internal variability or since 1850 to 1900, we can see a clear increase in the temperatures over the Asian region. And these are because in the, in the future also, these heat extremes are projected to increase. However, the cold extremes are projected to decrease that we can see from the right panel. And if we, see, we look at the observed changes in the precipitation over the South Asian region since the middle of the 20th century, there is a slight weakening of the precipitation, which is caused by the anthropogenic aerosol forcing. If we see for the East Asian region, like precipitation pattern was dominated by a dry Northern regions and wet Southern region, which is also caused by the impact of greenhouse gas forcing and also the aerosol forcing. However, for the 21st century, both the mean precipitation and heavy precipitation events are projected to increase for the, both the South Asia and East Asian regions. And if we also see for the high mountain regions of Himalayas and Tibetan regions, the snow cover has declined and there was a glacial retreat, which has happened that was documented since 1970s. And these events are also projected to increase with warming. And also the heavy precipitation is also going to enhance so there will be much more wetting over this mountain glacial, glacial region. And when we, so, so we have seen that most of the warming is affecting globally as well as the regional changes are we can see that. Because, and if you see for the ocean, because most of the heat in the climate system is absorbed by the oceans. Because of that, there is more, more warming of the oceans and sea level is increasing. In, in response to continued warming of the climate system, it is very certain that global mean sea level will continue to rise over the 21st century. By 2050, it is estimated that sea level, global mean sea level is projected to increase by another 10 to 25 centimeters, whether or not the, the greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. This is because sea level responds much slowly to the uh, other than the other components of the climate system. So that even if we cut down the greenhouse gas emissions, sea level will continue to rise. That will, that will be for centuries. So what is that like we, we are telling like there's an increase in the mean, mean sea level, but how, how can that be more relevant for the coastal regions? Because when the mean rain, sea level is increasing and we, we have a tight high tide, or a storm surge that is co-occurring with the tropical cyclone. All of this can produce the combined extreme sea level events. So that will be much more affecting the coastal regions and, and our mankind. So such extreme sea level events, the down panel, which is showing the amplification, like from 2050 to 2100, how these extreme sea level events are projected to increase. We can see like in the South China Sea, in the Western Pacific, and also in the Indian Ocean, also these extreme events are projected to increase. Historically, these extreme sea level events were continued to be rare, but it is projected that by 2100, such extreme sea level events will occur annually. And even if you see the mean pattern of sea level also, 
we can see like in the high emission scenarios by the end of the century, the higher sea level we can see in the equatorial Indian Ocean, Western Pacific. So there will be an increase in the mean sea level and also there will be increase in the sea level extremes. So as a whole, we can see that mean precipitation over the South and East Asia is going to increase. However, heavy precipitation events are going to also going to increase. The hot extremes are increasing all extremes are projected to decrease. Sea level is projected to increase and the extreme sea level events are also going to increase. As Yubaha already discussed, like tropical cyclones, like intense of tropical cyclones, they are also projected to increase with warming. So what are the key takeaway from this? We, we know like climate change is bringing multiple different changes in the climate system, which is increasing with warming. This includes changes in the wetness, dryness, ruins, snow and ice and coastal areas and oceans. The changes we experience will increase with further warming. So there is no going back. However, we can limit them. To limit them, to limit the global warming is strong, rapid and sustained reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions are necessary. This will help not only to reduce the consequence of climate change, but it also will help to improve the air quality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Swapna. Wonderful presentations, all of you. We really appreciate all the information. A reminder to our audience, please to ask your questions in the Q&A feature. We have a lot of questions to go over. Um, I would like to begin to, by asking each of the panelists a kind of a overall question. It's this is something we asked Jonathan Lin, the IPCC media officer as well in our last webinar. It's kind of our impression that climate change, the impacts of climate change have come on faster and more severely than maybe was originally expected going back to previous IPCC reports and previous predictions from the scientific community. Would you say that is a, a fair assessment? Do you, do you think that climate change has come on quicker than most of us expected? And, and, uh, uh, and if so, why do you think that is? I can start it uh, and then pass to uh, I, I would say that the, the evolution of the uh, different features associated with the climate change has been uh, very uh, consistent and accurate since the first report of the IPCC. Because the, the IPCC uh, uh, used, as I, as I showed, a range of scenarios. And so, what we are observing was uh, previously projected by uh, some of the scenarios that, that we are considering. So I think it's really important to shift from that perception that I can see the general audience, right? that, that we were in, under normal condition, conditions and in, in the sudden we uh, opened the door and disasters show up. No, this has been a gradual evolution in which each, with each degree of warming, the increment in the uh, climate change at the different regions, different extremes, uh, increase consistently. That, that, that is, would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, just to complement that, uh, I think that we have a much more clearer understanding of the dynamics uh, based on much more observational uh, a system we have in place uh, based on the different model simulation model they are much more efficient and then they can explore uh, different other aspects a better understanding also of the, the past the paleoclimate information and then new studies also that give to us more information and more clarity and in the previous report of IPCC uh, we hardly indicated that the extreme events and then related to the climate change. And then back with this report, more clearly it indicated the extreme event related to the climate. And uh, Carolina also projected a graph that uh, indicate the linear relationship between uh, the uh, accumulation of the uh, greenhouse gas, uh, particularly the CO2, and then the increase of the temperature. And then things are escalating because of the increase of the emissions and particularly the CO2 emissions. 
maybe a spot nut and uh, complement. Yeah, thank you. I would like to add on like from the previous report and well, we have got special reports from 2018 and 2019. Since that we have got new, new improved observational data, like we have got more historical data available. We have got more sim model, model simulations, improved model simulations, and also the better understanding of the climate system. All of them have caused like we, we have a better understanding or attribute, we can attribute the impacts of climate change. What is, what is, why, why the climate change is affecting us. So there is much more focus on the attribution. And also there is more focus on the regional impacts. This is one of the novelty, like what we can see, like we have got different regions, specific regions, and we can see like what, what how the climate is going to change, especially all the different regions around the globe. So these are the, some of the novel, novel things in the R6 report as compared to the previous report. Thank you. Thank you all, it's very helpful. So as, as you've mentioned, this report focuses much more on specific regions, which is very helpful for our journalists to improve their reporting. And as expected, we've received a bunch of questions on specific regions that I'd like you to each answer if possible. Uh, Carolina, I'm hoping you can talk a bit more about the Latin American region and what people there can expect, especially with the melting of the Andean glaciers and changes, for instance, in the Amazon uh, rainforest ecosystem. Uh, Yuba, we've got a question, especially, especially about South Africa and the coastal regions. What, what can coastal regions like Cape Town and Durban, but also, also other coastal regions around Africa, what can they expect uh, to, to happen as a result of climate change? And swap now, there's been a question, a couple of questions specifically about the Himalaya and the Hindu Kush mountain ranges and uh, what uh, the impact of climate change there will be. So maybe we start off with Carolina to talk about Latin America, please. Okay. Um, also, I, I, will, I, I am copying in the, in the chat a link to the uh, regional fact sheet. Uh, the regional fact sheet, we have a, a spent a lot of work trying to translate for each region in words and with a few um, maps, uh, the information for each of the regional uh, assessments. Uh, we have a, for a Central and South America, a particular uh, a regional view, and uh, there are common regional changes. Let's say the mean temperatures have a very likely increase in all subregions because we divide it, it in specific subregions and we continue to increase the mean precipitation is projected to, to change with increase in Northwest South America, Southeast South America, and decreases in other regions, like let's, let's say Northeast South America and Southwest South America. Uh, compared to global mean sea level over the last three decades, relative sea level has increased at a higher rate than global mean level in South Atlantic and the South uh, Tropical North Atlantic, and at the lower rate in the East Pacific. Um, and also, as you uh, mentioned, uh, the, we have a, as a region the mountains, right? And so there is a, de a decrease in snow and ice and increases in pluvial and river flooding uh, projected with high confidence uh, uh, to the, uh, over the tropical, um, subtropical Andes. And uh, in addition, in the southwestern South America and the extratropical Andes, a glacier volume loss and permafrost thawing will likely continue in the Andes Cordillera under all greenhouse gases emission scenario, causing important reductions in river flow and potentially a high magnitude gla a glacial lake outburst floods. I will stop on that. That's an, an example of some of the features. Thank you, Carolina. You, bud, you want to talk about coastal regions in Africa, what they might expect? Yes, uh, I got a question related to specifically uh, South Africa, and that related to the fact that uh, South Africa is uh, uh, using uh, fossil fuel and particularly coal, and there is no way uh, African Union can force any country to do anything about it. 
And uh, within the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, each of the country have been uh, asked and then to uh, determine the, to define their national determined contribution and then how they plan to reduce the emission and that is needed. And we'll go to much more details in the IPCC uh, uh, report on, uh, on the mitigation aspect. But in any way, uh, the African Union cannot force any country, even the United Nations Framework Convention cannot uh, force any country and then to uh, do something about it. The good thing also of this report, the new thing of this report is uh, the linkages and then the connection with the air pollution and the climate uh, on the, the, the emission at the same time. If you reduce your emission and other, you can deal with the, your air pollution aspect. And in the case of the coastal area, there will be a much more in-depth analysis of that in the working group too. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, uh, co-chair of the working group uh, two on adaptation, vulnerability, and uh, uh, um, uh, an impact uh, is from uh, uh, Durban, and this is Deborah Roberts at the municipality, and then so that we will have find more information, more detailed information on the case, provided that there is some studies that has been done. And uh, one have to be in mind in the African context, there's limited scientific literature and even uh, uh, great literature on number of issues. And IPCC is not conducting any research, is assessing the literature, uh, largely the peer review literature, and then to certain extent also the great literature, and then to have the traceability of the information. So please be patient. And then with the uh, uh, special chapter on Africa of the working group two, you will have detailed information. Thank you. Thank you, Yuba. Swapna, would you be willing to talk about the impacts on the Himalaya Hindu Kush, please? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is already shown that the snow cover has reduced since the early 21st century and the glaciers over the high mountain regions have thinned and retreated over the Himalayas and they have lost mass since 1970s. However, over the Karakoram region glaciers, it is as a stat, it has slightly gained mass or it is approximately in a balanced state. That is what the observed change is talking about. However, with the increase in the temperatures, it is projected that there will be glacial retreat and snow melt and also there will be rising temperature and precipitation can increase the occurrence of glacial lake outbreaks. Yeah, that is what is projected for the high mountain regions and especially many regions of Asia. Thank you all very much. Now we're getting a lot of questions about things like adaptation to climate change and mitigation, solutions to climate change, just a reminder and policies regarding climate change, what policies uh, those questions, a lot of them are going to be answered over the coming months and year in the, at the COP26 Climate Summit in November, and when Working Group 2 report and Working Group 3 report are released early next year, we will ask our panelists, if we have time, we can ask our, our panelists some questions on that, but in the meantime, we have a few more questions about the kind of the science of climate change and what it's revealing. Uh, we have a James, yes. If I can, uh, because the, the, the working group, the, the report that has been released, uh, integrate the finding also of special reports. And then the special report on 1.5, the special report on the land and climate, the special report on the ocean. And clearly, uh, the special report on 1.5 indicated that uh, we can still make the 1.5 and that has been reiterated by the uh, this report that has been released provided that we have a fundamental changes in all aspects of society before main um, transition the transition of the energy sector and then that address most of these people who indicated the mitigation uh, element on the energy issues 
the transition of the uh, uh, infrastructure urbanization, uh, including the uh, transport sector, the transition of the land, including the agricultural sector, and the transition of the uh, industrial sector. Uh, as a matter of fact, in many African countries, they are in the early stage of development. And then they can live from in most of those different areas to avoid increasing the emission. The report also indicated that any uh, bit of warning matters. It is not because you are not emitting a lot of uh, gases, that does not matter. And those are just some element to respond to the question so that they will not be frustrated as that you have not responded <laughs> to the question. Thank you. Thank you, you. But yes, and it's very important for all of you as journalists to be reporting on these efforts at transition, transitions to renewable energy, low carbon development, uh, clean mobility. Those are all wonderful topics for journalists to cover in your own countries and regions. What are your governments and, and other authorities doing? What are businesses doing to move our society towards um, uh, more low carbon a uh, uh, society that is uh, reducing emissions of greenhouse gases. Going to be, that is going to be crucial to try and keep us uh, at a global uh, warming of no more than 1.5 degrees. A couple of interesting questions about climate science that maybe our panelists can answer. One from Sied Raza. Um, if we reach 1.5 degrees, especially um, Will there be disruption to food chains, to, to the food distribution system? Is that something IPCC has looked at? And uh, you know, are we already seeing disruptions to, to food supply as a result of climate change? Again, that, that is, has not been assessed in this report. No. Uh, it, but it was um, uh, the, the, the interaction, I would say, between climate change and agriculture systems it was uh, partially addressed in the report uh, that uh, Yoruba mentioned on, on land, and definitely it will be assessed on, on working group uh, two. Okay, uh, another question from Yameru Lorian. But Yoruba, I think, wants to add something probably from the previous report. Well, I, I, just want to, I just want to add it that uh, it will be a shifting that the report indicated a shifting of the dry uh, areas in the uh, African context. And then it will be also uh, more and more frequent heavy uh, uh, extre uh, heavy, uh, extreme event, such as heavy precipitation on much more uh, increase of uh, uh, drier. And then clearly those will be affecting and then the agricultural sector, as I indicated, a large part, for instance, of the African agricultural system, a small scale farming system, and a maximum of 7% of the land are irrigated. And then so that clearly, and then it will have some impact on that. Thank you, Yuba. Yeah. Another question about impacts on animal behavior, or perhaps maybe more broadly, uh, is the IPC looking at the interplay between climate change and biodiversity? Uh, we know that our, our biodiversity is also facing a global crisis, an extinction crisis, and um, that we know there's a whole system of studies similar to IPCC set up specifically for, uh, for biodiversity. But I'm just wondering if you guys do look at the interplay between the impacts of climate change on biodiversity. Is that something the IPCC is studying or uh, assessing? Here again, you will find a lot of information on uh, 1.5 report, and then okay. to look at the impact climate change and uh, uh, biodiversity. And recently IPCC and uh, IBES organized an extra meeting on uh, climate change and uh, biodiversity. And then we will find more in-depth analysis on the uh, working group two report, and then that will be not only on human, but uh, on uh, different ecosystems, and then the impact of uh, climate on different ecosystems. Okay, James? 
No, that I saw a question uh, regarding the um, uh, COVID and if it was assessed, I think this is something important and relevant, maybe yeah. uh, just, just to let you know that I, I could make some comments on that. Please. Uh, okay, uh, we have a, a lot of questions regarding if the emission reductions during the COVID-19 lockdown slow the rate of global warming. Uh, uh, we could um, uh, we assess that during the COVID confinement, uh, a relatively sh a small short-term reduction in CO2 emission was observed, was around 7% uh, for 20 to 2020, uh, on average compared to the previous year. Uh, this did not lead to a discernible effect on the rate of global warming, because the CO2 emission reductions uh, occur in a short period of time. So we need uh, but, but, but at the same time, this was a, like a lesson learned, no? because we confirmed that if the CO2 emissions are reduced, the temperature, it, it can, can, it, that, that could be a potentially helpful. And a, a, it, it was also discernible effects on air pollution during this time, which shows that the reduced emissions can rapidly, rapidly result in cleaner air. And so, uh, linking with other questions that I saw that they ask, uh, because I mentioned if uh, we, ha we make strong reductions, uh, how, uh, how we can do that no? to keep the temperature below uh, the 1.5. Uh, and that is uh, re related with how much uh, CO2 we can emit, considering the CO2, the carbon budget, right? And so, uh, the report shows that to limit the 1.5, uh, to, to, to limit the warming to 1.5, uh, we should uh, uh, keep the reductions around the 45% per decade. That is roughly 5% per year. So if we are able to transition uh, uh, to uh, keep a sustained reduction of uh, around 5, 7% per year, we would be able uh, to uh, uh, limit the one uh, the warming at 1.5 degree level. Thank you. Right, that's very helpful. Thank you, Carolina. I I do I would like to ask a follow-on question, Carolina. So we did see a decline in emissions uh, during COVID over the last year, decline of about seven percent in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and I understand that does not immediate result in changes in, you know, in temperature, but uh, I, I was, I thought we might see a change in the measure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, but when the latest results of the Keeling curve, you know, how, uh, how, how ca carbon dioxide concentrations are measured uh, all the time and um, but when we looked at the Keeling curve, uh, we did not see any real impact of this drop in emissions in the latest findings on carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. Is that something to be concerned about? Or do you think the, uh, the, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions was too short to really affect uh, our measurements of green, uh, carbon dioxide emission concentrations? Exactly. Uh, uh, the, 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 the issue is that uh, the reduction in the emissions uh, it lasted uh, in very short period. We need sustain. So uh, that, that was an evidence that um, a, 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 in addition to the what that I showed, that is what it matters uh, is uh, the, how much you accumulate and, and how, how that uh, uh, amount of CO2 persists in the uh, in the atmosphere, right? But uh, again, as I said, there, is, there, are, there are positive lessons learned, but uh, uh, we, we, we didn't uh, have discernible changes as maybe people were expecting, right? Mm -hmm. Just to add on that, it was uh, largely related to the slowdown of economic activity, and particularly the transport and um, And then uh, they, uh, uh, when the activities restarted, and then all the gain in emission has been completely, uh, you know, uh, taken. Okay, we got a lot of questions coming in and I'm aware we're running out of time. So I might ask several questions at once that perhaps you can help me answer. 
uh, which places in the world are being most affected by climate change uh, today and perhaps in the future? Uh, a question journalists are wondering about, maybe you can help answer should, you know, about the terminology. Should we be changing the way we describe this from climate change to climate crisis? you know, or climate emergency? I said, all right, should we be changing the way we describe this, uh, this whole uh, change? Does anyone want to answer these questions? I can I answer the part of the regions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't remember, sorry, if Swapna showed the figure nine, did you show the figure nine? of the? Because this is a, a, a great figure to answer regarding the, the the changes in the region, right? Uh, we 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 don't do uh, region rankings, um, but uh, we instead we try to collectively uh, try to assess how many regions are or are already and um, projected to be impacted for changes in the climate conditions. And so here, as uh, I, I I am showing in the uh, in this list all the uh, climate, uh, uh, sorry, cl climatic impact driver that we have assessed, uh, say how uh, aridity, uh, different types of uh, droughts. Oh, you, you have plenty of different details, landslide, uh, wind, hail. And, and here, this column show how many regions of the world, uh, in how many regions of the world, these uh, climatic impact drivers are projected to change. And uh, we can confirm that all regions of the world uh, are included here, right? But we can see, for example, that almost all regions of the world are uh, projected to be impacted by changes uh, in the extreme heat and mean surface temperature, as I showed, and also a reduction of the cold spell and frost. But this is very interesting. In all coastal regions, in almost all coastal regions, we, we have projected changes uh, in coastal floods, in coastal erosion, marine heat waves. So uh, we invite the, the audience to uh, have a look at, at this, this figure in more detail because it provides this big picture, right? Instead of trying to find the hotspot with it, because now it's the whole globe that is changing. <laughs> so we, which are the key aspects that are changing at each region and how a uh, gather all these regions are being affected. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. And just a follow-on question. So all these graphics in the report, are they free to share? Journalists are wondering if they can use those graphics in their reports. You're muted, Sorry, Carolina. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I will share the, the, the page, the web page that we have all the material. I already shared the regional fact sheet. I, I will share the, the link to the full report and you have access to everything from this, uh, there they are, they are uh, some, some of the materials too technical, but uh, you you're, uh, you have access to all the figures and, and other. Uh, just to add to that, IPCC is the most transparent organization I have ever seen. Everything is on the web, including the 78,000 comments Carolina indicated with the responses of those comments. You go to the IPC website, you will find them so that everything in IPCC is accessible. Just you have just to give the uh, um, the response, and that's very important. As we will not assess anything if there is no traceability of the information we bring on our reports. Thank you all. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, how do you measure uh, the extreme climatic events how, how yeah how are extreme clima climatic events measured as each particular event is is it according to some kind of degree of impact uh our, our participant asks about the for instance the sapir simpson hurricane wind scale for cyclones and hurricanes this is a kind of scientific question how do you measure these extremes and ex the the extent to which we're seeing an increase in extreme events. So Abna, do you want to go ahead with that? 
Yeah, thank you. Just to elaborate, like heat, suppose if you're looking at the heat extremes, so they are defined like, we look at the daily maximum temperatures over the land, and when they are exceeding a certain, over, over a decade, if they are exceeding an, on, on an average or once in 50 years during certain period, we, we always compare with the reference period that is about 1850 to 1900. So whenever these daily extreme, daily maximum temperatures over the land were exceeded on an average once in a decade or once in 50 years, they are defined as the hot extreme. Similarly, the extreme precipitation events, they are defined as the daily precipitation amount over land that was exceeded on average once in a decade with respect to 1850 to 1900. Similarly, the agricultural and ecological drought events are defined as the annual average of total amount of soil moisture below 10 percentile with respect to 1850 to 1900. So with respect to that period, how much is that daily maximum temperatures or the extreme precipitation, that is how it is defined in the report. I, I would like to add that, the, uh, as Swapna says, we have an indicator, right? There's an amount of precipitation a day, but uh, um, for each extreme, for each impact driver, we have two other dimensions, that is the frequency and the intensity. And so we assess both. And so in some, uh, for some extremes, we have confidence in the changes in the frequency and or the intensity, right? Yeah. So it's important to distinguish those two features which are quite relevant. Thank you very much, that's helpful. Um, this is an interesting question. What is the forecasted deadline for fundamental changes to take place to stay within the 1.5 degree Celsius increase? People often think in terms of deadlines and I know that's well, I don't know, maybe that's not the way to think about it, but what, what is your answer to that question? Well, as, as I said, there are two uh, fundamental conclusions. Uh, one is that uh, 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 we expect that we will uh, be about or around 1.5 in the next 20 years, right? That, that says something. Uh, and we uh, also conclude that uh, what we emit today will have an impact in the near future, in the future. Um, and, and also, uh, as I said uh, uh, before, if we continue the rate of emission, so degree of emission that we are doing now, we will likely to be about uh, uh, two degrees by middle uh, century. And so uh, these are evidences that reductions in the, uh, of in the emissions uh, need to be done fast and consistent in the next few years. I don't know if Swapna or Yoba wants to add. Yeah, exactly. Like we, we are seeing that 1.5 degrees are expected to be there in the next 10 or 20 decades. But if you go from a 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees, a half a degree, 0.5 degree warming can have a lot of impact on the climate system. Like it, it can cause more, more extremes. Like we have already seen like hot extremes are increasing. With a half a degree of 0.5 degree of warming, you can expect these events to get amplified. So like that, that, that is the major implications like from going to 1.5 degree to 2 degree itself, we will experience much more of these extremes. So that is the point we need to consider. Thank you. Um, so perhaps rather than thinking in terms of deadlines, uh, referring to what our speakers said earlier, we should be looking for hopefully 5% per year reductions in greenhouse gas emissions on a steady basis. And that might just get us to limit increase to 1.5 degrees. Um, I know we're running out of time actually. So uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, we can't answer everyone's questions. Hopefully we were able to answer most of them. Um, and this, this, um, this webinar will be recorded. The recording will be shared with you. The presentations will be shared with you. And we at the Earth Journalism Network will be doing many more webinars in the coming months and years on climate change. So. Stay tuned for more information on that. But I do want to ask 
one final set of questions to each of our panelists, please, before we wrap up. Um, what do you think in your mind was the biggest surprise to come out of the report? Was there some something unexpected uh, that came out of the report that you think you'd like to remark upon? And also, do you have any final advice for journalists trying to cover this very difficult, complicated global issue? What would your advice to journalists be uh, as they go about this in the coming months and years? Carolina, would you if like I to come, start? If I, can, ahead, if I can, yeah. I, I, I think that uh, uh, clearly, really, uh, we did not see anything that was a surprise to us as IPCC because there was intense intensification of the work assessing the literature because we had in the whole history of IPCC, I think mean, three special reports in this cycle. And then that is uh, uh, intense work. And then we uh, digest a lot of literature on, and then also the interaction between the three dimensions of the climate, the physical science, the impact, and then the mitigation that give to us, there is no surprise. Uh, to ask what happened. And, but what we'll be advising to the journalists, because we have a scientific jargon, and then we do not know, we have no skills how to communicate the complex information to the general public. And then they have the ability to do that. And then each of the journalists coming from different parts of the world, and then from Asia, from uh, Africa, from Latin America, from the dry area or from the uh, low-lying coastal area. And then they can distill from the report because what we present and we discuss is only a summary for the policy makers. And then this is 30 pages that came from two or 3,000 pages. And then they have a mine of information and then that they can inform from the street kids and then to the policy makers with a language that they could easily understand. Thank you. Thank you, Yuba. Well, as uh, Yuba says, uh, we have been in, uh, in elaborating reports each almost two years. So it has been a tremendous journey for us. This is the fourth uh, report uh, since uh, 2016. Uh, and so uh, uh, we didn't get the uh, uh, surprises, right? Because this is a kind of, um, of a process. But uh, what I, I would say is that we made a bet, I don't know, we, we made a, an extra effort to, to expand the information, the regional information, uh, moving from not only uh, talking about weather and climate extremes, but also to talk about uh, the uh, climatic impact drivers. As, and that for the working group one was a tremendous effort because we, um, we assess uh, other components of the climate system uh, that are more related with the surface. Now we're talking about landslides, we're talking about floods. Um, I was impressed that about, about the quality, that we, we were able to provide quantitative and fundamental uh, information about that. That was a challenge, and I'm happy that we did it. It's a big step for, for our assessment. Thank you, Carolina. Swapna? Yeah, uh, what I feel like there, it, there's not a, it's not a surprise because what of whatever is presented in the report, we have started experiencing them. We are getting more of uh, many, many of the extremes like temperature extremes and rainfall extremes. We have started experiencing. So that is only, only assessed in the report. So it's not a surprise. Like it's what, what we are experiencing and what we are telling is that this, this will be enhancing with warming. So that's one of the thing. And also like the, this report is also having an interactive atlas that is very much useful for every, every key, key person. Like they can, they themselves can go to the atlas and they, they can see what the region, what will be the impact, how, how much will be the changes that is projected with global warming or by the end of the century. So everybody can look into the interactive atlas and they can see like how, how the regions are going to get affected. And as a journalist, I think the rich there are much more focused on the regional information. So they can pass the, this information to the region and they can help the people to understand like how the climate change is going to affect the regions and so that people can get adapted to the changes. So that, 
that thing, I think that that may be one of the important things I would like to ask. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to all our panelists and speakers for helping to explain this very difficult and challenging subject and such an important subject. I personally believe this will be the most important issue of this century for all of us, and we really need to be able to understand it and report on it and explain it to our audiences. Uh, just a reminder to our to our audience journalists, please, we're going to be sending out a survey. Please let us know what you thought of this webinar. Was it helpful? Or were the things we could have done better? Uh, we always want to improve our 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 broadcast on this. So we really appreciate your taking the time to just a few minutes to answer that survey, please. And reminder that there will be more programs coming to you with this. We're very thankful again to uh, the UN Foundation for supporting this, uh, these, this set of webinars. There'll be a tip sheet coming out soon, uh, uh, taking information from this webinar, putting it down on, on our website, and we'll be sharing that with all of you as well. So lots more to come. There's gonna be a lot of coverage, especially in the coming months as we come to the COP26 Climate Summit. And that will be important for all of us. But overall, just the main thing I would say is, you know, journalists and scientists, we really need to work together. Scientists have this very valuable information and understanding. Journalists do have the means to communicate that. And we need to find ways to collaborate to uh, be able to tell the world about what to expect and what we can do about it. So thank you again to everyone, to the Earth Journalism Network, to the UN Foundation, to our speakers and the IPCC as a whole. This is such important and valuable work. And we thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us. Stay tuned for a lot more. Be well, everyone. Take care. Stay safe.